بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الهداة المهدين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا Illuminate your majalis and your hearts with a loud salawat for Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We mentioned the last few nights the hadith of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam where he says amongst the greatest blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give anyone is health when you are free from sickness and illness and pain and injury. But at the same time that Imam Ali alayhi salam says health is amongst the greatest blessings of Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that sickness is also a blessing for the believer. So how does that work? Health is a blessing and sickness is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such that the Prophet said if the believer knows how much good is in the sickness he's getting out of the sickness and the illness that he is in he will never ask Allah azza wa to cure him. So how does it work? This is the beautiful system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the believer. No matter what he does to you no matter what falls upon you, it's for your own good. And Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is narrated saying, Ajibtu lil mu'min. He says, I'm so surprised at how spoiled the mu'min is. Mu'min like every single one here. Anything that Allah writes for him or her, it's for his own good. If Allah writes health for you, it's for your good. If Allah writes sickness for you, it's also for your good. If Allah writes wealth for you, it's for your good. If he writes poverty for you, it's all for your good. And the point that the Imam is highlighting is a believer can never lose in this dunya as long as he what? As long as he stays attached to Allah. No matter what happens to you, it's good. Whether it is wealth, whether, whether it is poverty, whether it's health, whether it's sickness. But the condition is if you're a believer and you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how is sickness a blessing? We mentioned. Number one, sometimes we said last night that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicts us with a sickness, with a disease, wal'iyadu billah, in order for hum, in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from the swamp of disobedience and sin that we are stuck in. You see, health is good, but sometimes health may lead to bad results. Why? If you're always healthy, you're always strong, eventually what tends to happen is you start to feel invincible. You start to feel immortal. I'm strong. I never need to go to the doctor. I don't need any pills. My physical capabilities are at their climax. Sometimes we get carried away, brothers and sisters, when our health is prolonged, meaning there's a long time without any sickness. And what happens there is we fall into the state of ghafla. You go into cruise control. And once we fall into the state of ghafla, this is when everything that is bad and evil starts happening. Why do we many times forget about Allah? Why do we ha struggle in praying? Why do we forget about our akhirah? Why is it sometimes we become so arrogant? It's because we feel invincible. We don't feel that there is a need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're not sick and you're strong every single day, it's not that easy to remember I need Allah. When do you remember you need Allah? When you fall sick in your bed. 
this is when you remember that I'm a weak human being and I need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah wants to take you out of that cruise control of sin and disobedience. He wants you to focus a little on Allah, on your akhirah. So he'll send the sickness. So that will be a reality check. Don't just look at the mirror and admire your looks and your muscles the whole day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you weak one day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even your looks, He will take them away from you certain days. For those individuals that are in the teenage years, one of the worst things is when you wake up and you see a pimple on your face, right? This pimple, brothers and sisters, is something that you should thank Allah for. Do you know why? Because it's a reality check from Allah. Allah wants to tell you, don't be too consumed by your body, by your smooth and beautiful face. Don't be too distracted by it such that you think this is going to continue forever. Allah will send that pimple to remind you, this is the dunya. Focus on more important things, not just your face. You spend an hour putting makeup. How much did you spend with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes He has to put these things that are bad. But is it because He hates me? No. Because He sees I'm obsessed with my looks. I'm obsessed with my muscles. I'm obsessed with my entertainment, my iPhone, my social media. So He has to send some distractions, some disruptions. And these disruptions are good so they wake you up. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is narrated saying in a hadith, لَوْلَا ثَلَاثْ فِبْنِ Adam." If it wasn't for three things that happened to us human beings, we would never put our head down. We would always be so arrogant and proud. Number one, he says, al marav sickness. Sickness humbles you. It brings you down to your heels. Number two, poverty. Poverty also humbles us. And number three, al maut death. The fact that we know we're going to die one day. No matter how arrogant and mighty someone is, they know that they're going to pl be placed in that grave. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do that? So that you become humble a bit and not so arrogant. The Prophet says, with all these three, yet you find the human being is so arrogant. Yet the human being is so forgetful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and feels so powerful and invincible. Sometimes there, I, I notice this, there are some people who don't want others to know when they're sick. They feel like it's a stigma. Because what? They have a reputation of being very strong, of being very, you know, they might call it as being very tough or whatever, but it's most of the time arrogance. They don't want others to know that they got sick. Do you remember a couple of years ago when the president... When I think of arrogance, I don't know why, I just, right away I see Trump's face. You might disagree with me, you might like his policies, but you know, just the way that he talks and nobody can fix the economy and nobody but me, nobody, it's, I mean it's just arrogance at its highest level. Remember when he got COVID, how he kept it a secret and he didn't want anyone to know why? Because COVID humbles you, brothers and sisters disease and viruses humble us and this man cannot tolerate being humbled the worst thing for the arrogant person is when he feels weak Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends sicknesses and viruses sometimes to remind you not to be so arrogant so that was number one we spoke about last night number two we said the second benefit of sickness and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala design sickness to be a part of life and remember I mentioned this clear distinction there's two types of sicknesses. Some, they are self-inflicted. It's when I eat bad food, when I don't eat healthy food and I don't care about my health. That is not the sickness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for us. That's our fault. We're speaking about the second type of sickness when it's not your fault. When it happens without a known cause or it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault that did something like that person that went and ate that bat. Uh, soup or whatever it was and then everyone else on earth had to pay for one guy's bat soup meal so is that my fault no but there was nothing I can do to prevent it 
We're speaking about these times when it's not your fault. It just happens. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wanted this. The second benefit of being sick, next time you think, think about it in this way, is that with sickness comes forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that we're always putting a heavy load on our back. Sin after sin after sin. How many times do we repent? Rarely. So Allah Azza wa Jal sends these sicknesses so they shave off, they remove the load off our back. And that's why there are some people who die from a disease. You'll find that they're battling cancer or some other disease and they'll spend the last months, sometimes years of their lives in the hospital. These people, we feel very sorry for them. But these individuals, brothers and sisters, on the day of judgment will be the happiest people. Because when they die, they die 100% pure. What else is left for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hold them accountable for? They paid for everything through the sickness. So when they die, they literally die an angel. No sins at all. They're going to be happy on that day. They're not going to be so sad. Why I was sick my whole life, I had this problem, I had this injury, I had this pain. They will realize that it was worth it. So this is number two. It doesn't stop there. Number three, and this is one of the most remarkable aspects of sickness, is the sick days that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. If any of you work here, you know that your employer is legally supposed to give you, they have to give you, at least five, six days a year. It's very lousy, just five. Meaning, those five days, 40 hours, if you were sick, you are entitled to stay home, rest, and you will be paid. But it's capped at what? I mean the minimum, five days. You might be lucky you work at a better company, they'll give you 10 six days, sick days, paid sick days a year. Or even better, maybe 20. Have you heard of any company that gives you more than 20 six, sick days a year? Paid six days, 25. What's beautiful about the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He Himself has devised a sick day program. What do I mean? You see, when you're sick, you need to rest. You can't focus on your job. So you're home resting, recovering, and you're getting paid. So you don't have to worry about the bills. But after five days, six days, seven days when you run out of your sick days now your stress intensifies why if you're not getting better not only do you have to put up with the sickness now you're so consumed how am I gonna provide for my family how am I gonna pay my mortgage especially if you have a, a, a terminal disease your job, your employer isn't going to care. Even if they're merciful and nice, they're like, you know what? We can't just pay you for free. Five days, 10 days, 20 days, but sorry, we have to let you go. So now you have to put up with the fatigue, with the pain, with the struggle of the sickness. In addition, how am I going to pay my bills? That just destroys you mentally. Allah Azza wa Jal has a very similar system, but way more generous. When we're sick, brothers and sisters, sometimes the sickness prevents us from some good deeds. Some good deeds that we're accustomed in doing. Salat al Jum'ah, I never miss it. But one Jum'ah, I can't go because I'm sick. The lectures, I come every night. One night I can't come because I'm sick. I recite dua, dua kumail every Thursday night. I do volunteer work. Any good deed. Sometimes you'll not be able to do that good deed because of a sickness. You feel terrible. You're sitting in bed. You wish you were there helping, reciting dua kumail, salat al jumuah, listening to the lecture. Whatever good deed that you were doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not let that thawab that you used to do go in vain. He counts it for you while you are resting in your bed. One day, it's narrated the book of Al-Kafi. The Prophet was sitting with his companions. All of a sudden, they saw Rasulullah smile. The Prophet smiled. His companions asked them, what happened, Ya Rasulullah? They knew Jibra'il was coming all the time, so something good happened. The Prophet said, just now I was informed of this. 
two angels from Allah Azza wa Jal, they came down by the order of Allah. Allah ordered them to go and watch and observe a particular person. What good deeds he's doing and record it. Now you might ask, what's the purpose? Don't we all have two angels that write our good deeds and bad deeds? So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send these two specific angels? Now the hadith does not indicate, but what we understand from this hadith is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has different layers, different groups. So there's the two angels that are entrusted for every single individual. You have two private angels just for you. One for your good deeds, one for your bad deeds. In addition, from time to time, Allah sends other angels maybe higher level they come and they make sure maybe that these angels are what doing what they're supposed to do they're not missing anything so they come and they record what you're doing so the prophet says those two angels Allah sent them to check on someone they went to his prayer rug he has a specific place where he prays every day and by the way this is something very good make it a habit that when you pray pray on a specific area in your house and then from time to time change that area yani every month in one corner in one area why because the traditions tell us on the day of judgment that piece of earth the ground that you used to pray on will testify for you in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he used to pray on me in this area so scatter your salah so that you have all these different positions and areas that are testifying for you on the day of judgment. So anyway, they tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah sends them, they go to the place that's designated for the salah of that person, for the dua, wherever he used to do ibadah. And they find that he's missing. He's not there. They look, they search, they can't find him. Until they go in his bedroom, they see that person is lying down on the bed sick and they can't do anything. So they go back to Allah and they tell Allah Azza wa Jal, these two angels, Ya Allah, we want. And we, just like all the time, just like the habit that this person has, we thought he would be on his prayer rug. We thought he would be in the masjid. We thought she would be sitting in this specific seat and the masjid, you know, there are even some people when they go to the mosque, they sit in the same place every day. Some days you see they're not there. You're like, is everything okay? I hope they're fine, you know, because they rarely miss a majlis. So they notice that that place is empty. They tell Allah Azza wa Jal, they weren't there doing their ibadahs. But we found them that they're sick. You had made them sick, Ya Allah. You had tied them up in sickness. So what do we do here? Allah says, they were not doing their daily ibadah because of the sickness that I brought down upon them? They say yes. Allah Azza wa Jal says whatever they used to do on a normal day in which they were healthy, write it for them no matter how long their sickness takes. One day, two days, five days, six months, five years, let it be a terminal disease. I started a good habit. Today I said alhamdulillah this Ramadan I'm going to start attending Salat al -Jum'ah. I attend two or three times, then I fall sick and I can never know. For the rest of my life, Allah will write me Salat al -Jum'ah. Because the reason I'm not going is because of the sickness. If it wasn't for the sickness, I would have went. How beautiful is that, brothers and sisters? And it's completely unlimited. One day, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam visited Salman al-Farisi. Sallu ala Muhammad. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam narrates this hadith. Imam Ali visits Salman al Farisi because he heard Salman was sick and Salman was absent. So he went to visit Salman, the great companion of Rasulullah. He sat down next to Salman and he asked him a question. He told him, Ya Aba Abdullah, that was the kunya, the title of Salman. Kayfa asbahta fi illatik? How do you feel in this sickness? Salman was a very wise and pious man, very righteous man. So he told Imam Ali alayhi salam, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, 
الحمد لله كثيرة I praise Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal, a lot. Not just a little, you know, he's just saying that because it's what he's supposed to say. I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. Salman is wise. He knows that the sickness is rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to him. But then he tells Imam Ali, but I do complain from one thing, not from the sickness. أَشْكُوا إِلَيْكَ كَثْرَةَ الضَّجَرِ I complain of boredom. I miss you, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib. I'm bored. When you're sick, you just have to lay in bed the whole day. It's, sometimes it's boring. Especially if you're someone that's active. Salman, he's always with Imam Ali السلام, praying behind him, spending time with him. He's out. So he has to spend the whole day just lying in bed. He tells Imam Ali, that's my only issue is that I am bored. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam gives him a remarkable reply. He tells him, Ya Salman, do not be so bored. And then he explains to him what happens to the believer when they are sick, bored, in their bed, waiting for the shifa from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recovery to come down. Listen to the hadith of Imam Ali. The Imam told him, فَمَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ من شيعتنا يصيبه وجع any one of my Shia the Shia of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib it is the greatest honor brothers and sisters to be a Shia of Imam Ali and being a Shia of Imam Ali is decided through your actions not just through your words not just because I was born into this family then you're automatically a Shia. You're automatically a Muslim if you're born to a Muslim, to Muslim parents. But you do not inherit the tashayu of your parents. Listen carefully, brothers and sisters. My parents may be the best Shia. I will not inherit any of that automatically. To be a Shia of Imam Ali is a position that every person has to earn. Follower. How do you be a Shia of Imam Ali? You act like Imam Ali. You speak like Imam Ali. You follow the teachings of Imam Ali. Obviously, you cannot be like Imam Ali, but at least try, try. The Imam himself on the member one day, he said, look, oh people, you cannot be Ali ibn Abi Talib. You can't, Ba'd. Ali ibn Abi Talib is something else. But at least try, don't give up. Try to be honest. Try to be faithful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to pray your salah on time. Try to stay away from haram. You may slip a few times. You may not be successful all the time, but at least make it a goal. The problem is many of us, it's not even on our to-do list. It's not even on our bucket list. It's not something that we even strive to become like Imam Ali alayhi I want to become like this athlete. I want to become like this singer. I want to become like this. Do you want to become like Imam Ali? You're not going to become like Imam Ali, but do you want to? Is that even something that you wish when you put it in your head and you strive and you work for it? At least you'll become 1% of Imam Ali and that's amazing. If I can be 1% of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. So the Imam sa says, he tells Salman, any one of our Shia who faces an injury, pain, any type of suffering, sickness, that will be purification from their sins as we spoke about so the Imam is telling Salman I know you might be bored but it's worth it you're being purified so Salman he asks a question he says Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, is that the only benefit we will have our sins cleansed Salman rarely used to sin he was very close to the level of being almost infallible so Salman is sitting there and you know what, I don't really sin that much. Probably a couple of times a year. So am I really benefiting from that? For sinful people, they should wish to always be sick because it works for their benefit. But if I'm not a sinful person, and that's very, very rare, we all are sinful individuals. Okay, I want more than just my sins being washed away. Imam Ali salam replies to him. He tells him, Ya Salman. Look at how the system of Allah works. When we become sick or we suffer any type of injury, automatically 
the purification you're given. Every minute of pain, of struggle, Allah will remove sins slowly off your back. However, do you get rewarded in addition to sins being forgiven? Does your status go higher in the eyes of Allah? Imam Ali says that does not come for free. It's not automatic. You just need to do one thing. What is it? Sabur. Be patient. If you are patient, Allah not only forgives your sins, but in addition, you're having two of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala systems working in your favor. At the same time that your sins are being forgiven, Allah is writing reward for you, constant reward and elevating. You're just going up, 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 higher in the ranks of the believers just because you are what? You are patient. So he tells this to Salman. Patience, brothers and sisters, when we are sick, is not as hard as you think. There's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq where he explains what it means to be patient. He says, the one that becomes sick, فَقَبِلَ ذَلِكَ فَتَقَبَّلَ ذَلِكَ بِقَبُولٍ حَسَنٍ Whoever becomes sick and they are patient and they accept what's happening to them, every night, listen carefully, every night of sickness, Allah gives you how much thawab? Laylatul Qadr, we spend it 100 rak'ahs. We spent seven, eight, nine hours. We're told it's greater than how many nights? How many? Nobody knows? 1,000 months, so 30,000 nights. So 30,000 nights is how many days? Or how many years? Almost 80, right? Laylatul Qadr, the greatest night out of the year. You have to spend it in ibadah, right? It's not, it's easy, but I mean, you have to do something. The hundred rak'ahs, it's going to take about an hour, two hours. Uh, Dua al-Jawshan, the three surahs of the Quran, do some istighfar. But it's worth it. You're getting 80 years of ibadah. Al-Imam al-Sadiq says one night that you're sick, but you're patient. And I'll explain one second. But you're patient, Allah gives you the reward of 60 years. 60 years. So when you're sitting in bed, you're bored. You may be suffering. You have a cold, a fever, pain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on that night that you sleep, because you can barely even get sleep when you're sick, Allah will give you 60 years of ibadah as long as you're patient. So the Imam was asked, what do you mean, taqabbala? How do I accept? How do I become a patient individual? The Imam, in this hadith and another one, he explains, he says, do not complain to Allah. Do not complain to anyone. When people come and visit you or when you see people after that, don't start complaining the whole time. Oh man, you don't know what happened to me. That night I couldn't sleep. It was such a terrible night and I saw nightmares and I was sweating and this and that. First of all, who cares? Second of all, most people don't really care, right? They may act polite. Second of all, don't do that because once you complain to the created, you lose the ajr from the creator. You are allowed to complain, brothers and sisters, but complain to Allah only. Tell him, Ya Allah, help me. Ya Allah, I need strength from you. Ya Allah, bring down your cure upon me. Do not object. Some people will object. Why Ya Allah? I spoke about this. Why is this happening? Why am I not getting cured? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, Habibi, because I love you. You sin way too much. I want to elevate your status. You think with your lousy salah, you're going to get to paradise? Your salah that from A to Z, it's all incorrect and fast. And there's absolutely no concentration. Allah wants to take me to paradise to a higher level. He says, there's, that's the only way. There's nothing I can do. Everything, all the other opportunities you turn down. You don't come. You don't even show up to any programs, to the masjid. Ramadan, you're busy and sahras and doing this and that. So Allah says, you know what? I'm going to force you to go to paradise. By what? By sending sickness. It's because he loves me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the hadith, he says, do not complain to other human beings. And do not object to Allah. 
You can tell other human beings that you were sick. You're just informing them. But do not complain. The Imam says, if you can withhold the venting, and I know this is very hard for some people. They love venting. Venting, you know, it's a, it's a way to relax. It's a way to let out all that stress and grief. You can vent. But vent to Allah Azza wa This is what the Imams would do. The Prophets, anytime they would have problems, anytime they would have any type of suffering or difficulty in life, they would vent to Allah. But don't object to Allah. Tell him, Ya Allah, Ya, ya Allah, you are the one that can do miracles. You can change everything. Give me patience. All you need is patience, brothers and sisters. If Allah gives you patience, you can withstand the greatest of the sicknesses and diseases. That's all you need. You know, Musa, it's narrated that he used to read a dua, a beautiful dua. He used to say, Ya Allah, do not make me too sick such that I collapse nor keep me healthy all the time. He doesn't want pure health all the time, nor sick all the time. He asks Allah, give me something right in the middle. Some days I'm sick, so I start appreciating your favors. And some days I am healthy. So on those healthy days, I can use those healthy days to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to really value what I lost when I was sick. So we have to experience both brothers and sisters. You will never appreciate your health unless you become sick. You will never appreciate all the beautiful organs that Allah azza wa jal has given you until one of them starts malfunctioning. Inshallah Allah azza wa jal doesn't need to take you to that level so that you start to appreciate him. But if, if, if it had to be, and that was the will of Allah, know that it's for your own good. So he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best dua is, Ya Allah, mix sickness with health. Some days I'm sick, some days I am healthy. This is the best for your spiritual well-being. So anyway, Imam Ali, going back to that story, Tell Salman, if you're patient and you complain only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only will Allah azza wa jal forgive your sins, not only will Allah write for you whatever good deeds that you were naturally doing but you cannot do because of your sickness, Allah will even write you more good deeds that you never even did. And this is a notion that you will never find but with Allah, brothers and sisters. Imagine if your employer tells you, if you come to work, eight hours, I'll pay you $100. But if you're sick in your bed, I'll pay you $300. Which one would you choose? Well, you might say, which sickness, right? Which sickness and how many days? Well, maybe a week of sickness, that's worth it. I'm not doing anything. I'm just sleeping on my bed. And I'm getting paid. I'm not just getting paid. I'm getting paid double, triple what I would get paid if I would go to work. This is what happens to a believer when they get sick. Allah says, look, on a normal day, you spent that night praying Salat al-Layl. Reading Quran. Tonight you're sick. Not only will I forgive your sins. I'll give you the thawab of Salat al-Layl. I'll give you even more. And you didn't pray Salat al-Layl. Is it better to be sick, brothers and sisters, or healthy all the time? Be healthy all the time, you're just preventing, denying yourself from all that beautiful, free thawab, ajr. But to be sick all the time is also tough. So that's why the dua of Musa says, Ya Allah, let me be sick some days, and let me be healthy some other days. And this is exactly what Allah does to most people. Right? There's nobody, very rare people are sick their whole life. And I don't think there's anybody that's healthy their entire life. And that's why everything, brothers and sisters, that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, appreciate it. Thank Allah for it. Because Allah is only doing it for my own good. I may not understand until the day of judgment. There's a hadith that I read. It's so beautiful. You know, in the month of Ramadan, I mention this and we hear this every year. 
Well, what's beautiful about Ramadan and what makes it unique and remarkable is that when you breathe, Allah writes tasbih for you, subhanallah. And when you sleep, Allah counts that as ibadah. There's a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he tells Imam Ali, he tells him, Ya Ali, the one who is sick, injured, in pain, what do they do sometimes? They moan. They moan. They'll be saying, ouch, making some noises because of the pain. The Prophet tells Imam Ali, Aneenu al-maridhi tasbih. A marid, a sick individual that moans, Allah writes that as tasbih. As long as you do not complain to people, only to Allah Azza wa Jal. Hadith, a beautiful hadith from Imam al-Baqir or Sadiq. He says, when those two angels come to see what you're doing, after they're informed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course Allah knows that this person is sick and he's not doing their ibadah. Allah azza wa jal, now he turns to these two angels, the one on your right that writes your good deeds, the one on your left that writes your sins. He looks at the one on the left and he gives that angel on the left, who I sure we all despise because he's constantly writing our bad deeds. He tells that angel, as long as Abdi, the servant of mine, is sick, you have no right, R-I-G-H-T, to write, W-R-I-T-E, any sin against this individual. Khalas. As long as he is sick, because I made him sick, do not write any sins. Now, does that mean you can go on a sinning spree if you're sick? No. Don't abuse Allah's mercy, because Allah is smarter than you. Allah Azza wa Jal wants you to feel better emotionally. That look, I'll be more forgiving. I'll be more lenient because you're sick. That doesn't mean take that as an excuse to commit every haram in the book. And then he orders the one on the right. He says, you, yalla, get to work. The other guy can rest. Get to work and start writing worship for this man. So the hadith says that angel looks at you and you're just in your bed not doing anything and you're just making all these noises and you're moaning. Ya Allah, what do I write? All he's doing is making these annoying noises because of the pain. What do you want me to write? Allah Azza wa Jal tells him, those annoying voices to you, they are tasbih to me. Right, tasbih, 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 tasbih. And then the Prophet says, wasiyahu. Sometimes the pain is so severe, you start screaming. That is also tasbih. A couple of months ago, some of you heard about this story. One of the brothers of our community, he was studying in another state. A very, a very tragic incident happened where he was injured in his leg and they had to amputate his leg. A young man studying in another state. They had to amputate his feet, his leg, and this is above the knee. And he spent, I think, two or three months in the hospital. I spoke to one of the relatives of this young man, 19, I think, or 20 years old. Very promising future in front of him. He lost his leg. I spoke to one of his relatives after he went and visited him from here, from Michigan, in the hospital. I said, how is he doing? Is he, is he okay? And it was probably like a couple of weeks after the amputation. They said, Sayyid, it's the worst place to be just to be by that person. It's so heartbreaking. I said, why? They said, because he is shouting the whole time. I said, why? He said, because of the pain. I said, there's no painkillers? They said, there are painkillers, but even painkillers have a limit. You can't just keep on giving those high doses. You can, you're only allowed to have you know, this much within an hour or two hours, and it's not enough. So what does he do? He just shouts. He's not complaining to anybody. He just shouts. Ouch! The whole time. The Prophet says every time that person shouts and screams, Allah writes that as dhikr and tasbih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote that entire stay in the hospital as Laylatul Qadr. Every minute, every night of it. So yes, you suffer. You go through a lot of difficulties, but in the end it's worth it. And any time, brothers and sisters, we speak about patience in the face of sickness the most inspiring story or one of the most inspiring stories 
that we are told of in the Quran is the story of Prophet Ayyub. Wallahi, it is so touching. Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about this Prophet Ayyub in multiple verses. Ayyub was the son-in-law of Yusuf. Yusuf, the king, the prophet. Some traditions say he married the daughter, some say the granddaughter. His wife, obviously, was the most beautiful woman of her time because Yusuf is her father. If Yusuf was the most beautiful person Allah ever created. So, and that's, I, I, you see, you know, I'm related to Yusuf, that's where, anyway. So, Salli ala Muhammad wa I'm not related to Yusuf, I'm joking. So, Ayyub has a perfect life. He's a prophet, but he was rich. He owned massive lands. He owned all this livestock. The most beautiful wife. And he had all these children. Some traditions, 10 children. I saw a tradition that says 18 children. So he had the best life possible. The shaitan is envious. He can't stand it. He sees this guy has the best of both worlds. He's living like a king and he's a prophet. It doesn't make sense. Where's the suffering? See, it's not, brothers and sisters, it's not easy becoming a prophet. The prophets of Allah have the most difficult lives, trust me. You think your life is miserable? You think your life is tough? You think you're suffering? Every single prophet suffers more than every other non-prophet. That's why they become prophets, is because of their patience and their dedication and their resilience. So the shaitan, he starts complaining to Allah. He says, Ya Allah, the only reason Ayyub is such a good person and he's always praying on time and he's thanking you because you gave him everything. If you give me everything, I'll do the same. Allah tells him, no, I know Ayyub. Ayyub is a genuine person, not opportunistic. Shaitan keeps on complaining. Allah Azza wa Jal decides to try Ayyub with a very difficult test to show that Ayyub is a true gem. So all of a sudden, one day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away all his property. There's a huge fire. He loses everything. They tell him, Ayyub, all your lands, your orchards, your, the animals, anything you used to own, all died, all gone. The hadith that's narrated, you know what he did? Quickly went to sujood and he thanked Allah Azza wa Jal. He thanked Allah Azza wa Jal such that the angels of Allah were impressed. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, I tear my $20 shirt or dress and I'm complaining for an hour about it. Ayyub loses everything and he does sujood. Thanking Allah Azza wa Jal. He said, Allah gave it to me. Allah can take it back whenever he wants. I didn't lose anything. It wasn't mine to begin with. So the shaitan, he's like, Ya Allah, well, you just took his property. What about his kids? He has all these beautiful kids. He's going to rebuild his business again. So Allah Azza wa Jal, in one day, you see how the test of prophets is so difficult? The shaitan starts what? He starts messing with you and he starts to focus all of his animosity against you because for most of us, the shaitan doesn't have time for us. He has smaller shayateen working for him. He sends them to us. But the prophets of Allah and the imams, no. He knows that he has to go after them and he can't. So Allah takes all of his children. Just one day, something happens, an accident, every single child of his dies. They're not children, sons and daughters, 10 or 18, depending on the different narrations. They tell him the, the news, they break the news. If you're told that one child is sick in the hospital, what do you do? Imagine if you're told that every single son and daughter just died. What does he do? Once again, he goes to sujood. He says, Allah, you're the one that brought them to this dunya. And you're the one that took them back to you. They're not dead. They just moved to a different life. I thank you, Ya Allah. The shaitan is so aggravated. What's up with this guy? There's nothing that will break him down. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for more. For more suffering. 
for Ayyub. And Allah knows Ayyub can take it. So then poverty begins to strike. He has no food to eat. Then he starts getting sick. He can't move his hands. He can't move his feet. He can't do anything until he becomes fully paralyzed and in pain. The only thing that he could do, the only thing that was functioning in his body, his eyes, he could see, his ears, he could hear, and his tongue, he could speak very slowly. Or else he was on the floor. So now he cannot even get food for himself. His children are all dead. The community abandoned him. You know why? Because they start saying, if Ayyub was really a prophet and Allah loved him, Allah would not take away all these good things from him. And this, brothers and sisters, is what really hurt Ayyub. You know, there's a tradition from one of the Imams where he says after Ayyub, after this entire story, Ayyub was asked, what was the most difficult test that you went through? Losing the children, losing, you know, the poverty, the, the humiliation. He said the worst thing was the gloating of my own so-called religious community. We thought you were religious. We thought you were a prophet. This is what really broke his heart. And I've heard some people who go through difficulties, disease, sickness. They have a, a, a child who is handicapped. And they tell me that the pain of what people say about us behind our backs and sometimes no even in your face no shame is more than the pain of the actual disease or virus or the problem that we have we don't know brothers and sisters how much damage this tongue can do when we speak about other people and we start to give all these interpretations why is this business going down why is this health going down why did he get divorced why 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 always giving it bad interpretations he became sick, he can't eat. His wife, her name was Rahma. So either the daughter of Yusuf or the granddaughter. She wants to provide for her husband. She doesn't want to leave him. Very righteous woman. You know what she started doing? She was the daughter of Yusuf king. They were so wealthy. She started working as a maid. Just so she can buy enough bread for her and her husband. That's how their life became. Yet they were so thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what's really heartbreaking? The tradition says that one day his wife, she went to serve in another house. They told her, we don't need you today. She wanted to go serve some, nobody wanted her. Nobody even wanted her to work as a maid. Because they're like, this is a cursed family. God doesn't love them. So she found a salon somewhere far, a woman's salon. And she went and she asked the person there, can I work here and help you? The lady said, sorry, no, we don't, there's no need. But she said, but maybe I can help you somehow. How? She says, can I see your hair? So that lady that owns the salon, she says, can I see your hair? The wife of Ayub. She says, yes. She looks at her hair. She sees it's very good, nice hair. She's like, if you sell me your hair, I'll give you this amount of money. My hair? Sell it to you? She's like, yeah, I can sell it as a wig and make a lot of money. So I'll, I'll pay you for it. And she wasn't even paying her that much. She thinks it's a very difficult decision. What do I do here? She does not complain once. She says, fine, take it. She sells her hair so she can buy some food for Ayub, the prophet, and herself. And she goes back home. When Ayyub found out, his heart was so broken that he knew his wife had to sell her hair just to bring him food. And then some of those so-called worshippers, those monks, they came to visit Ayyub. And they're like, yeah, Ayyub, what's going on? What sin did you do that Allah is doing this to you? You know how many years he was suffering? Seven years, the hadith says. Seven years. And not once did he ask Allah, Ya Allah, cure me. Such that his wife, the hadith says, asked him, You're a prophet, ask Allah to bring that end to this misery. He said, I'm embarrassed to ask Allah to cure me. She said, why? How many years did Allah give me those good days? 
How many? They were more than seven years. They were, let's say, 20 years. Whenever my sickness becomes longer than my good days, that's when I'll ask Allah to cure me. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not once, can you believe that? He asked Allah azza wa to cure him. He was just praising Allah all the time. But when those so-called worshippers came and they started to stigmatize him. And what sin did you do? This is when he turned to Allah Azza wa Jal and he did a dua. Allah records his dua in the Quran. What did he say? وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ When Ayyub, he told Allah and he cried to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbi, Ya Allah, nada rabbahu anni massani al-dhur. Ya Allah, you see my situation. You see all the tragedies and the pain and suffering. And you are the most merciful. He did not even ask Allah to cure him. He just said, Ya Allah, you see what I'm going through and you're so merciful. As soon as he made the dua, Allah Azza wa Jal, he sent an angel. He erupted, the angel erupted a, a, a like a well or a spring right by his feet. And he took from that water and he poured it on Ayyub. As soon as the water fell on Ayyub's body, he recovered just like day one. And Allah Azza wa Jal cured him of all his sicknesses. See the next verse. Allah says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ فَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِ مَنْظُرُ Allah says that I answered his dua and I relieved him of his misery. وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُ And then Allah resurrected his sons and daughters, all of them. And he gave him more kids. And he gave him his property and everything that he has lost. And then Allah Azza wa Jal ends the verse by saying, وَذِكْرَى لِلْعَابِدِينَ that let this be a lesson, a reminder for all those that worship Allah. All those that claim to be righteous. That when you are in a state of despair and you're suffering, Allah Azza wa Jal can also help you and save you. But sometimes Allah wants you to be patient. So that you can reach those high levels of Iman and be with the prophets and Imams. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant you all the best in this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your a'mal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of all our deeds. Anyone that is sick, Ya Allah, we ask you to give them patience. To give them patience and resilience and to eventually cure them and elevate their status. And let us end by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha for all the believers, all the mu'mineen and mu'minat that are in need. After a loud salawat for Muhammad and Al-Muhammad.